Uh, hi, everybody. Sorry I can't be there in person. Go ahead, Marla. Okay, everybody. Oh, can you hear me okay? Is this working? I'm just going to turn you up a bit. Okay. okay. Good? That's better? Yep, I think we're good. Okay, great. All right, so Gaetan already went through my uh, bio. Um, my main focus with work is to deal with soil quality issues in, within Manitoba in general. Um, and so that can range anywhere from dealing with salinity, dealing with uh, residue management and tillage, dealing with water, um, whether it's dry soil or wet soil, that kind of thing. And so I was asked to uh, prepare a presentation kind of on two different ideas. Um, one was dealing with kind of soil quality and crop rotations, and then another question that I had was whether or not I could present on vertical tillage. And so I thought I could actually bring these together to a point, um, because really, whether it's crop rotation, whether it's rotating your fertilizers or thinking about your soil fertility, or whether it's tillage, it's all dealing with managing your soil quality in general. So I just kind of wanted to focus on soil quality. See if I can. Okay, um, so what is soil quality then? Uh, soil quality in general is how well the soil does what we want it to do. So whether it's regulating water, whether you're sustaining plant or animal life, filtering pollutants, uh, recycling nutrients, supporting physical structures, um, that is what makes soil quality. Now there's a bit of a debate between soil quality and soil health. And I'm sure a number of you have heard that buzzword soil health. It's being used quite a bit, um, especially stateside. And uh, they have, USDA actually now has soil health specialists that are working with them. Personally, I like to use the phrase soil quality. Um, they're a bit interchangeable, but health is a human attribute. And so I think of quality be, being something that leads to yield. And within agriculture, we're really looking at what makes soil good, it does what we want it to do, and that is sustaining plant life and animal life for agricultural purposes. So there are three groupings for the soil quality parameters. We're going to focus mostly on chemical and physical, but for the chemical we're looking at things like soil organic matter, um, pH, electrical conductivity, which is um, a measure of the amount of soluble salts in the soil, extractable nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The physical is things like soil structure, depth of soil, uh, infiltration, water infiltration, bulk density, and water holding capacity. And then the biological is where we look at microbial biomass, potentially mineralizable ends, so that nitrogen that could come out once microbes have kind of chewed away on it and converted it, um, and soil respiration. So to look at um, the chemical properties, how do we affect these? Well, pretty simply, tillage and removal of crop residue is what's going to have an impact on things like soil organic matter. Um, if we look at pH, we can actually affect pH through nitrogen fertilization because nitrogen can actually acidify the soil or at least acidify the band where the nitrogen is applied. Um, pH actually, too, if you have a soil that changes pH with depth, so sometimes they have a lower pH subsoil. If we're doing a lot of deep tillage, we could bring up that lower pH subsoil and mix it in with the topsoil, and that could effectively um, bring down, say, the pH of, of the topsoil slightly. Electrical conductivity, um, increasing water table, which Mother Nature does quite nicely, but we do have some of an somewhat of an impact on depending on how we use that water table. Um, that water table coming to the surface brings salts close to the surface. And extractable nutrients, well, if we're growing crops that are removing the nutrients without putting them back, then we can affect the extractable nutrients there. So I wanted to focus on salinity because that's one of the, uh, the soil issues that I get a lot of uh, calls about. And especially right now that we've started to dry out a bit after a wet um, couple of years and a major wet cycle. Salinity isn't seen usually in wet years because during those wet cycles it's diluted, but the salinity problem is driven by moisture. So what happens is 
You have all these wet years that brings that water table closer to the surface. And then you have the wicking of moisture as the soil dries out um, to, like from that soil water table or from the water table up to the soil surface. And that brings those salts up to the soil surface. So sometimes the effects of salinity can be quite subtle, uh, something that you see just by certain indicator weed species here, or sometimes it's a salt flat. It's quite obvious. Um, so this is a salt crust we see west of Holland. Holland is quite uh, an area with quite a bit of salinity to it. And then here again is one of those indicator species. So we see foxtail barley and kochia. And I'm sure a number of you have seen um, kochia and boxtail barley in saline areas of your fields. So you're probably no strangers to that. So what conditions then are required excuse me, to create a soil salinity problem? Well, you need to have soluble salts. Those are present either in the subsoil or the groundwater or a combination of both. And those are brought closer to the surface when that, that water table comes higher. So that's the second thing then, is you need water. You need the water table bringing those soluble salts up to the surface. But this is agriculture. We usually talk about just having these two conditions that are required. But the third condition really is that you need to have plants that are susceptible to soil salinity. If we didn't have plants that were susceptible, then we wouldn't talk about salinity because we wouldn't see an impact on yield within agriculture. And those plants that are more susceptible are pulses and oil seeds. Um, and so we'll see that a fair bit, that they will be the first plants that are affected within our crop rotations when we start having a salinity problem. So how does salinity um, vary within the landscape? Well, you can look at this map or this diagram as kind of a general, it, it looks a little extreme, but this happens very subtly within the field. It also happens over a, a large area, if you consider this a higher area being, say, the Manitoba escarpment and then the low area down here being the, the area down at the bottom of the escarpment. But what happens is on these higher zones, we call them recharge zones, and this is a non-saline area where precipitation is falling and infiltrating down in through the soil profile and increasing the water table. Where we get lower down on, this, on the landscape, this water table is coming closer to the surface. And where it comes closer to the surface, this is where that capillary flow or that wicking effect can drive up and actually bring those salts to the surface. So the saline area would be down here. And we call this a discharge zone. So recharge and discharge are the two different terms. The other thing is that in these little tiny pockets and potholes that we have, um, you can also have what we refer to as the bathtub ring effect, where you see that that saline ring around potholes, around wetlands, that is actually an effect of the water that's sitting in this low area and pushing up from the bottom um, to the edge around it. And that's actually causing that, that saline uh, creep or the, um, the capillary flow is based on hydrologic pressure of the water sitting in that, um, cooling in that spot and pushing up around the edges. The same thing happens when we look at something like roadside salinity. So you dug a ditch where there was no ditch before. It's changed the subtle hydrology of the surface. And that ditch is full of water and pushing, um, pushing that, that salt up to the surface along the edge of the ditch. And then this is just a really general map looking at the extent of surface salinity in Manitoba soils. So down in around the Dauphin area, this yellow is um, 5 to 15 percent of the area being affected. This orange area down here uh, around the bottom of the lake is in the 15 to 50 percent of soils being affected. So you've got some areas where there's pockets of, of salinity that are present. So that's just a quick note on chemical. Um, on the physical parameters, how can we affect soil quality with the physical parameters? Well, you'll see an underlying theme here, and that is tillage traffic and crop rotation. Um, so whether it's soil structure, bulk density, infiltration, or water holding capacity, any time that we drive on or move the soil in any way, that will affect those soil quality parameters. And crop rotation has an impact on those two based on how long a crop is in a rotation, if it's you know, an annual crop versus a perennial crop. 
When it comes to depth of soil, this one is pretty simple. The only way that you are going to affect your depth of soil is really through erosion. And that could be you know, water, wind, or tillage erosion effects. So let's talk a bit about soil structure, because soil structure then carries through to a lot of the, the discussion later on on tillage. Um, soil structure is basically how soil particles and the pore space between them are arranged. Uh, it, it has a major influence on water movement, on biological activity, on root growth or seedling emergence. And the soil aggregation will decrease the risk of erosion. And here, um, I'm not sure how well you can see this photo, but looking at this photo, there's lots of roots that are hanging here. This was um, a forage field, a grass forage field. Uh, that we dug a soil pit into. There's actually a fair bit of salt uh, that you can see in this soil, but along the edges of the roots there are little kind of crumbly bits of soil that are hanging there, and those are aggregates. That is good. That is good soil structure when we see those kinds of aggregates. Um, and that the stability of those aggregates then, say if we push, put them in water, uh, ran them through a sieve and kind of dipped them in water, how well they hold together being dipped in water like that compared to a, a field where the aggregates um, just kind of dissolve away in water very quickly, then that's really how we, um, how we give a scale of how well aggregated a soil is. Um, and soil aggregation and soil structure in general is your number one natural defense against soil compaction. So you want to know that you have a well aggregated and um, good soil structure to be able to deal with soil compaction potential problems. So what is soil compaction? Simply put, you squeeze together your soil particles and you reduce the space that's between them. So here we have a, a diagram of a non-compacted soil. There's lots of pore spaces in between these soil particles. Um, the water is kind of held tightly around the edges of these, and there's a lot of space for air to move. And simply, if you squish that down and compact it, your, the water stays where it was because that's actually filling space, but you've reduced the air spaces in between. There are two different types of soil compaction, uh, natural and human-induced. And natural compaction is seen usually where we have high levels of carbonates in the soil or high amounts of sodium will have a bulk density in those cases that's greater than 1.8 grams per centimeter cubed. But really, human-induced compaction is what we see quite, uh, quite a bit more often. Um, and that is due to either excessive or untimely tillage or wheel traffic. And by excessive tillage, I mean obviously a little too much um, compared to what the soil can withstand. Uh, untimely would be getting on when the soil is moist or too wet to withstand compaction. So here's just a photo looking at wheel traffic compaction, and you can see the impact here of all of those wheel lines um, on the growing crop. And there ends up being problems where water can infiltrate, the roots can't penetrate down very well, um, and uh, so you may see ponding water in the wet cycle um, along some of these tracks. This here is a photo of a corn plant. Um, and the roots, this is actually around Dougald near Winnipeg, and where the roots are coming down here, they, they penetrate down about four, four to six inches, and they get to that heavy plow layer where it's been sheared off and the roots just aren't able to make it down, and instead they all start heading out sideways. Um, a quick note, I guess, on roots is that, too, their plants are rather lazy, and they will take the the path of least resistance. So in cases like that, if they do find a crack to move down, they will make it through. Um, but if they can't break through very easily, they won't do it. So they'll stick to, to where they can move uh, quite a bit easier. So with soil compaction, I hear this a lot, and we've always used this phrase, is that you know we don't have to worry too much about it. Mother Nature will take care of it. The freeze-thaw process is going to fix my problems. And we've always kind of assumed that that was the case, um, but this here is uh, from Minnesota. Uh, the photo is taken by USDA, and um, it's the 1870 Wadsworth Wagon Trail. So this trail was in use for three years in the 1870s. Um, you can see the wheel track lines right in through here, and you'd think that after three years of use, 
and then a long period of time where it was not in use and freeze-thaw processes were able to um, take, you know, take their course. Um, you'd think that then if freeze-thaw fixes everything, then we wouldn't be able to see those traffic lines anymore. In reality, when they've studied this, they still see a 50% reduction in air and water permeability and still a 10% increase in bulk density, even though this wagon trail has not been used since the 1870s. So freeze-thaw might not be doing as much as we thought that it was, and so that's just something to keep in mind, and I'll return back to that in a bit. So then, when it comes to soil quality parameters, whether they are physical or chemical or biological, how can we measure them? Well, we can go out and use something like a soil quality test kit. We have a couple of these within Manitoba. Um, I've used them in the past when I used to run the Zerotel farm, and there's a number of pieces of equipment in here, and it really is just kind of a quick and dirty, quick and dirty test kit that we can use in the field. We can measure salinity and pH. However, um, more accurately, we would send these off to the lab. Um, and that's what I prefer to do in these types of cases, would be to use the lab for salinity and pH. But it is, we are able to get kind of a quick idea in the field using a kit, a kit like this. Um, but we can do soil structure and aggregate stability, um, soil texture, bulk density compaction, water infiltration, and soil respiration. Um, another part of the test kit is to do earthworm counts. And I don't know if you guys are all aware, but um, when it comes to earthworms, you want to shoot for 10 earthworms per square foot. So if you guys are uh, looking for something to do in the spring or, or summer, um, you know, when you're not busy doing other farming activities, you can go out to your fields and dig a few little square foot sections and see if you can find 10 earthworms. So how can we then have this influence on soil quality, whether it be through crop rotations, through fertility or tillage? And first, we'll, we'll talk about crop rotations. So obviously, crop rotations, um, root depth is really where we differ between one crop type to another. So we often talk about a good crop rotation being diverse, and we want to see diversity. The diversity doesn't just come in above ground growth. It comes in below ground growth as well. This is from Swift Current in 1998. Um, wheat here is kind of the standard that the canola and field pea are being held against. So this canola number here, the 65%, is um, the root length density, 65% um, as a percent of wheat, if wheat was considered 100%, so at 8 inches. And so as you can see, as we get down to 16 inches, 24 and 32, and then down to 40 inches, canola actually is quite active at depth. Um, and quite a bit of root uh, depth um, compared to wheat and also then compared to what it has at the higher depth. If we look at something like field pea, again, much more active at the top level, in the top 8 inches, um, and getting into the 1624, there's a fair bit of activity, but then it drops off very quickly oh, excuse me, and uh, doesn't make it... Um, uh, it doesn't really do much when we get down to these lower depths in comparison to canola and wheat. And again here, um, if you look at the blue bar, blue part of the bars, we're looking at the top 2 feet, 0 to 60 centimeters, um, and down at the bottom 2 feet. And so wheat, canola, again, quite active at the top 2 feet and continues to be a fair bit of activity when we get down to the bottom, the lower 2 to 4 foot depth. But peas, again, really just active in the top two feet. And so it's not to say that peas aren't good to have in our, our rotation, um, because if they do uh, make their own nitrogen, their, their legumes, is, they have a lot of benefits, but uh, they're different in terms of how much water they end up taking up um, and how deep they, they root. So we can also talk about the use of forages. So we get into something like an alfalfa and we move into an 8 to 10 foot rooting depth. Um, and this can be quite benefit, beneficial when we think about increasing nutrient uptake um, and decreasing leaching um, from, these, from uh, the root zone. So if wheat and canola is really only kind of highly active in the 0 to 4 foot depths and uh, nitrogen kind of gets down below those depths, 
then something like a forage would eat, or some ty type of deeper rooting crop would be able to pull that nitrogen up. Um, using forages will help increase water infiltration because those root, those root pores are created and they stay. There's also no tillage during the time that the foragers are, forages are in the rotation and so all of that helps to move water down through the profile. And in doing so it helps to decrease salinity as well because not only are you taking up water from depth and helping to lower the water table, but also you're helping to move water through the profile and that decreases salinity by washing those salts down. So just a quick um, note here on end fixing legumes. So uh, this is some quick data. It's not uh, very data heavy here, but this was back when I was at the zero till farm and we had two different crop rotations that we compared. One was the six year annual crop rotation and then we had a three years of annuals followed by three years of alfalfa. And so this year, the fall here was 2004, and uh, we took these fall nitrate samples. This was the year that the alfalfa was broken. So following three years of um, annual crops, we now had 24 pounds per acre of nitrate in the annual rotation. And following three years of alfalfa, we had 65 pounds per acre of fall nitrate. What that translated to when we looked at uh, following the Manitoba Soil Fertility Guidelines was we put down only 29 pounds per acre of nitrogen for the alfalfa land um, and 75 pounds per acre of nitrogen for the annual land in order to um, seed oats in the following year. Now a note of caution here, it looks like the oats yielded so much higher with the alfalfa um, and uh, considering the lower um, the lower nitrate or, or nitrogen application, um, but the oats were actually seeded six days earlier on the alfalfa land, and that again, this was 2005, it was actually quite wet, um, and so the alfalfa land was always easier to get on in the, in the wet spring, so there was a six day delay by the time we were able to get the annual land seeded and to oats. Um, the other thing is that these yields are low, and uh, we had light oats as well because there was heavy disease disease pressure, there was a lot of rust that year, and uh, as a result, um, due to a lot of different circumstances, we didn't get the oats treated, and so um, this is what we see, but really the savings is right here where we were able to seed these oats without much nitrogen fertilizer at all. And that was after, again, three years of, uh, of alfalfa, and a lot of people, have, research has been done to show that a three-year alfalfa stand is really where you get your biggest nitrogen benefit from. So cover crops, some people, a lot of people are talking about cover crops. Uh, we have a new professor um, at the University of Manitoba in the plant science department and her focus is on cover crops. And I'm very curious to see what she's able to bring to the province in terms of her expertise. Cover crops are beneficial because they can continue to take up nutrients and water after an annual crop is harvested, and that can help protect soil from erosion post-harvest and you know take up that extra moisture if we have a lot. But it does require an extended growing season. It needs heat and daylight and good growing conditions in order to actually get that cover crop established. And so while we see that this concept works well further south, um, north of the border, not necessarily, we're not seeing quite where um, the diversity and cover crop uh, species that we can use, and so I'm very curious to see what we can do here and if there is truly a place for cover crops in Manitoba. So back to uh, some of these chemical um, issues that we've been having and talking about salinity. So if you have salinity problems, can we actually mitigate those issues by growing specific crops? Well, first what we have to do is consider the relative salt tolerance of crops in Manitoba. This comes from our, the Soil Management Guide. It can be found online. And what you need to take away from here is that, in general, our field crops are tolerant. They have basically low or moderate tolerance. And at the top here, the six-row barley and moving down to canola, six-row barley would be the most tolerant um, in, this, in this moderate category and canola being the lowest. And again, in the low category, we move from sunflowers down to field beans. Now, 
things like soybeans and pulses in general are not very tolerant to um, or to salinity. But canola, winter wheat, spring wheat, a bit more tolerant. If you start getting into areas where now you're in the high um, high range, uh, there's not a lot of tolerance of field crops in that high salinity range, and then you have to start looking at forages more closely. So if you're starting to see your wheat canola rotation be impacted by salinity, um, then you need to start looking at some other alternatives um, in order to mitigate the issue. Now, this photo here is an example of a field that had mitigated, was managing quite well for the salinity issue, and then stopped their management, and this is what happened. Now, um, I'm not sure if you are aware, but the the impact of salinity on a crop is drought-like conditions because the crop isn't able to take up water. Um, basically, the salts that are in the soil are keeping the, or the water with them and not allowing that water to cross the root membrane and into the plant. So what you end up seeing as, a, as an indicator of salinity is um, a drought-like condition where there is adequate moisture for the crop to take up. So if we would have dug down in this area, there would be enough moisture, but it just didn't look like the crop was able to take it up. Now the history of this field is that three or four years prior to this crop failure, um, it had been in a perennial. Because 10 years before that, they were having some major salinity issues. And what they found was that they could not get their wheat canola rotation out of this field anymore, so they seeded it down to forages and walked away. Now the forages did very well because they were able to get established, they pulled down on that water table, it allowed a lot of those salts to leach down away from the soil surface, and the forage was chugging along beautifully. And then the price of wheat and canola jumped, and uh, the farmer thought, you know what, I need more annual acreage, let's dig up this field and see what happens because he hadn't been seeing any problems with salinity in, in the past few years, so he thought his problem was fixed. Now the thing with salinity is you don't fix it, you manage it. And so this is a perfect example of where he was managing quite well, and as soon as he took it out, I think he received, I think he had two years where he had a wheat and canola that did okay, um, and then those salts came rushing back and caused problems again, and this was the type of failure that he, he could see. So really, moral of the story, you know, he put he put that land into forage for a reason. He needed to remember that, and unfortunately, um, had to go through the cost of putting it all back down to a perennial again. So with salinity, you want to consider strategic cropping to manage your water, because salinity, while we call it a salt problem, it's really a water problem, and if you don't manage your water table, then you're not going to be managing your salinity. So if you remember that landscape position photo that I showed where at the top you had that recharge area where the water was infiltrating down, it's non-saline in that area. If you have a recharge area, you want to use a high water use crop, something that will suck up all of that extra moisture that's being added to the water table. And then down at the low area where the discharge area is, that's where you want a, a salt tolerant crop. Because the reality is down there, if the salts are present, you need something growing. If you don't have anything growing, then nothing is pulling down the water table. So anything growing down there is, is beneficial, whether it's salt-tolerant weeds or a salt-tolerant crop. So it's up to you to decide which one's better for you, either the weeds or the crops. Um, and you want to also look at increasing soil organic matter. So adding manure, um, crop residues. Um, type, you know, these forages with prolific brooding systems, all of that can help to, to mitigate the salinity. So moral of the story when it comes to crop rotation and soil quality is that you want to strive for diversity in your rotation. Um, you can mitigate risks that are due to weather and insect disease pressure and in the long term you are going to benefit your soil quality. So by looking at your crop rotation as a major part of your operation and making those decisions ahead of time, you are going to be able to benefit your soil quality. Um, you need to plan a rotation and stick to it. I know it's extremely hard to do when crop prices jump around, 
Um, and and we, we tend to think a little bit more short term um, when it comes to profitability. But in the long run, planning your rotation and making sure that you're managing that soil quality over time and having diversity in your crop rotation is going to be profitable. Okay, so moving on to the second part of this um, is uh, to look at soil fertility. And how is fertility going to be able to influence our soil quality? Well, I wanted to focus specifically on the concept of nutrient drawdown and this also to focus specifically on phosphorus. 57% um, of soils tested in Manitoba test less than the critical level of soil test phosphorus for uh, crop production. <coughs> Excuse me. So what that means is that a whole whack of our lands are low to medium in terms of the amount of soil test P. So we would be saying you know, 57% would be testing, say, below 10 and 12 parts per million. Now in Manitoba, we talk a lot about having these high, high phosphorus levels, um, and they typically are associated with lands, areas where we have a high density of livestock. But those areas are dense because they're small in nature around Manitoba, and so when we look at the rest of the lands, we tend to forget how important phosphorus is and how much we are lacking phosphorus in our soils for crop production. And a lot of that is because we're not putting enough down to manage the crop removal rates. The crop removal rates can be quite high for different, for different crops. Um, I want you to focus in here on the red numbers because this is what's removed in the grain only. If we looked at the entire crop, that would be here, but a lot of that residue is put back into the soil. Um, the canola typically would take out to remove in the seed uh, 46 pounds per acre of P205. So it's a fair amount of phosphorus taken up and removed from the soil. Um, in comparison, corn is also quite high. And then if you were growing this corn for silage, it would be that much higher because you'd be taking the entire plant off. Wheat is quite low in terms, um, in comparison, in terms of the amount of P205 taken off. And soybeans kind of falls into a moderate area here. And I know that there's an increase, um, increasing interest in soybeans in your region with, um, with new varieties or different varieties that don't require quite as long of a season. Um, so I wanted to focus in a little bit on the, on the aspect of soybeans and the rotation. So this is phosphorus uptake by soybeans during the growing season. And as you can see here, there's a huge uptake um, in terms of you know, taking up in that 63 or so pounds per acre of P205. And a lot of that is taken off in the seed. So very little is put back in terms of the residue. Um, and there's also an increasing demand that plant is taking it up all the way throughout the, uh, the growing season. But we need to consider crop sensitivity to phosphorus placement when you're making your fertilizer decisions for phosphorus because um, certain crops, especially soybeans in this case, uh, do not have a very high safe rate uh, for seed placed uh, P205 as map. So this is numbers taken from Manitoba. The other column here is from Saskatchewan. The difference between the two, both of these rates, the Manitoba and Saskatchewan, are based on using a knife opener with a one inch spread, but the Manitoba data is using a six to seven inch spacing and the Saskatchewan uh, is using a 9-inch spacing. So they would show to be somewhat more sensitive in some cases, especially for the soybeans, um, because you're putting more, potentially more um, fertilizer down in that, in that row when there's fewer rows there. So here from Manitoba, um, so our cereals quite tolerant to seed place map. Uh, canola not very tolerant, but soybeans really not tolerant at all. So obviously, depending on how you're placing your phosphorus, you can't put down that much with your soybeans. Um, it, they're sensitive, their productivity is dependent on a full stand, they don't have that ability to tiller to compensate for a thin stand. Seed is expensive, and you're putting the same amount of fertilizer down in fewer rows, so it's really concentrating that fertilizer down in these rows. So we need to consider rotating our fertilizers. And what this means is if you're going to be moving into using soy soybeans and you need to be more cognizant of making sure that you're putting that phosphorus down, 
you need to put it down with the wheat the year before the soybeans are uh, seeded. So you have to put them down ahead of time. And because wheat has a greater tolerance to seed place map, it gives you the ability to put more down with the wheat. And this is especially true where we're using narrow openers. We have low seed bed utilization. I also just wanted to show quickly some data here um, from the University of Minnesota where they looked at either seeding in the blue bars here, no, um, they seeded their soybeans with no P uh, P205 at all. And then here they put down either 50 pounds every year, 100 pounds every second year, this should say biannual, or 150 pounds every three years. So in the end, it was a it was the same amount would have been put down every year, or the same total amount. But they went with just a one every three year application. And there really wasn't any major differences in the uh, yields that came off from these two different regions. So what they were finding here was really in terms of the cost of putting the phosphorus down, um, putting it down once every three years was most economical. Um, I also threw in just a really quick slide here on residue burning. Um, and the reason being is because there's a major potential loss of nutrients. So if you want to think about putting those nutrients back into the soil, um, if you're burning it, you automatically lose almost every bit of nitrogen that was in, in that residue. And a good chunk, 75% of the sulfur that was in that residue. The phosphorus and potassium aren't lost at the same rate because those are concentrated in the ash. But the nitrogen and sulfur are oxidized and their loss is volatile gases. So that is a big loss potentially to next year's crop and future crops if you're burning that off. So then if you're not burning, you need to think still about your residue management and how you're going to be able to manage um, the massive amounts that you may get from some of these crops. And so the third question then from this presentation is how can tillage then influence my soil quality? Well, let's go back to soil structure because I've already mentioned that um, uh, soil structure is our one, number one defense against compaction and compaction comes through tillage as well. So tilling can shear off large soil pores that are created by roots and by earthworms and that'll slow the infiltration of water over time. And tillage can actually cause compaction. Compaction isn't just due to wheel traffic, but tilling can kind of fluff up the soil and as it settles out, those large pores are broken down and so you can actually have compaction happen over time after that tilled layer kind of settles. So can I prevent that compaction that's happening? Um, if I have to, I'm still tilling and that's okay, I need to do so, but how can I do so? How can I till in such a way that I can prevent or minimize the amount of compaction that I'm causing? You want to make sure that when you till, you till when the soil is dry enough. So the soil will have sufficient strength to resist that compaction. If you are tilling when the soil is wet, and by wet I mean moist, not sopping wet, but when it's wet, um, what happens is those aggregates, the soil aggregates that we work so hard to create, they become lubricate, lubricated um, and that reduces the shear strength of the soil. Those large pores are filled with air, if you remember back to that compaction diagram from before, and those small pores have water with them. Those large pores, when you put pressure on them or when you fluff them up with tillage and allow them to collapse in on themselves, the large pores will collapse and that results in compaction. So that greatest level of compaction can happen when your soil is at or near field capacity in terms of the amount of moisture. So a moist soil is heavily compactable. If you have an extremely wet soil, and here I'm talking about big, deep, muddy ruts when you're driving through a soil this wet, those ruts do damage soil structure, but they are not causing compaction because all of those pores are filled with water. And so you cannot actually compact them because the water is providing the strength for those pores to stay, um, to stay filled and stay open. That being said, you do again slide around and cause a lot of ruts. And those ruts can, um, they damage the soil structure, but they're not actually compacted ruts. They're considered uncompacted ruts. 
So can I prevent it? Well, of course. You can limit your field activities when soil is moist. And that's a hard thing to do, especially in spring when we're trying to get out and get seeding. Um, but waiting until your soil is dry enough to till um, would be the best at time putting any activity on your soil. Um, you also want to consider tractor performance. Um, don't over ballast. Run your tires at their rated pressures. There's a lot of, uh, of debate still whether wheels or tracks are better. When it comes to compaction, if your wheels, your tires are run at their rated pressures, so the tire pressures are low, then they are no better, in, or no worse, I should say, than tracks, or tracks are no better than wheels. Um, this is some information that comes from Ohio State. And here on the bottom, this red line is properly inflated duals um, compared to an overinflated dual, which is up here. So it's causing a lot more compaction and a decrease in porosity. And then if you're comparing your properly inflated duals to a 36-inch track, there's not a lot of difference between them, but the duals do, when properly inflated, run a lot less compaction than even the tracks and definitely than when, you're, when you have overinflated tires. So really consider making sure that your tires are running at the rated pressure. So we were talking about tire tracks before and we talked about that Wadsworth Wagon Trail. And I mentioned that this freeze thaw um, concept for fixing compaction may not be as accurate as we've always thought. And that's because um, a lot of work has shown that the freeze thaw may only affect the top two to six inches, maybe down to eight inches, depending on how cold you get and, um, uh, and how far that, thaw, that freeze can actually make it into the soil. But the trick is that with freeze thaw, you need multiple freeze thaws throughout the winter to actually break up compaction. So a single freezing and thawing event will not do the trick. And it's not that often that we get multiple, many freeze thaw um, to a deep depth um, to be able to break up compaction. So really that freeze thaw typically just affects that top two to six, maybe eight inches of soil. What they're finding is that wetting and drying has actually more of an impact on soil compaction, but that depends on the type of clay that you have in your soil. If you have the type of clay that causes these big cracks, um, and the Red River Valley, this is where this is taken, is near Glen Lee at the research farm. Um, if you have a clay that causes these big cracks when it wets or, and dries out, that is the type of clay that will be able to create these big pore spaces, and that breaks up compaction um, much more than freeze thaw has in the past. So can we then tilt to break up compaction? I get a lot of calls about this. Um, because a lot more people are worried about compaction and they're wondering about tillage to be able to, to fix it. Now, tillage is part of the problem, so it's hard to say that, yes, tillage will fix the problem when it may have created the problem in the first place. Um, so we talk about things like subsoiling, because the subsoilers will, soilers will run deep into the soil, and it's basically, um, depending on the type of subsoiler, uh, a, a form of vertical tillage because it's cutting vertical lines in the soil. Um, there have been farm trials in Iowa where they've looked at it and they've said, you know, it doesn't really pay. There is a reason why these subsoilers are as wide as your tractor, and that's because it takes a ton of horsepower in order to pull these things and a whole lot of fuel. And if you consider running one of these things up and down your entire field, there's a lot of fuel that's going into this. Um, and so these trials in Iowa, what they did was they split fields that were compacted in half. The farmers ran half of the field with a subsoiler and half without. And then they seeded their field to their normal crops and took the yield combine or the yield monitor with the combine and were able to see a difference in yield from one side to the other. And what they found was the yield boost that they got with the subsoiling you basically had a 50-50 chance of it being enough of a yield boost to cover the cost of the fuel for subsoiling. So the moral of the story with that, um, that farm trial was really to say, you know, focus on the lands that are really compacted if you're going to do it. So focus on the headlands. If you have truly compacted headlands, maybe doing just the headlands would be beneficial. And for any of you who are considering subsoiling, 
um, because you have some fields that you're not quite sure what else to do with, consider doing what they did, which is go in and do you know, 20, 30, 40 acres, not the entire field, um, and make sure that you're looking at the yield afterwards and are able to say, yes, this side yielded high enough for me to cover the cost of, uh, of subsoiling. So that's deep, deep tillage. Um, and then there's vertical tillage, which is a form of surface tillage or mulch tillage. Um, and does vertical tillage actually fracture the compacted layer like the sales bin says it does? I don't know if there's any sales bin of vertical till implements in the room. Um, I can't see you, so I guess that means I can say what I like. But uh, um, quite often I hear this uh, sales pitch come along with the vertical till implement that it will kind of bounce along and fracture the soil below and kind of break through the compacted layer like that. Well, let's talk a bit about vertical tillage then. Um, vertical till really, again, it's shallow tillage. It helps to size residue. It creates loose vertical zones in the soil. It, minimal, it has very minimal soil inversion. Um, and it does avoid horizontal smearing or the creation of a tillage pan um, below. It is classified as mulch till, but it is still full field tillage. So um, what I mean to say there is that there's an interest within the zero till population and the zero tillers to use vertical tillage to manage residue. Technically, the use of vertical tillage is tillage, so it would not make for a zero till system anymore once you introduce this very shallow tillage into the, into the system. There's a lot of different implements out there. Um, at one point, there is at least 13 different companies that you could call upon if you wanted to look at a piece of equipment like this. Um, there's a lot of differences in the equipment. Um, the angle will change your soil disturbance. So a true vertical till, these coulters will run straight uh, through the field. As soon as you put, uh, change the pitch, then you start to throw more soil and it becomes much more aggressive, creates a lot more soil disturbance, but doesn't become true vertical tillage anymore. Um, there's independent mounting for uneven terrain. You want to consider blade thickness. Um, thicker blades for stones, the number of waves per blade, so we'll change the soil disturbance. This here is a 13 wave coulter, so it'll have much less disturbance than this here, which is the 8 wave coulter. There's a range of different equipment types. Some of them, again, are more aggressive than others. This Salford here has um, also has a set of discs at front, um, then the 8 wave coulter, then the harrow bar and the rolling baskets. Um, this is a great plain turbo till. Again, it has uh, the eight wave coulter and the rolling baskets and harrows at the back too. But all of these pieces of equipment, they're all, they're all called vertical tillage, even though they might not technically all be classified as vertical tillage, depending on um, how aggressive they are. Like here with the discs would be much more aggressive than a true vertical till. And this photo here is just to show um, the wave up close so you can see this cut that comes through the soil and where it's cutting through the, the residue. Some of the observations in terms of the use of the equipment um, it is, can be effective in helping to aerate the seed bed and dry out the soil for seeding. Um, it definitely does chop and size residue nicely and helps to uh, level out the seed bed with those rolling baskets and harrows on the back, if that's the type, uh, if you get those kind of add-ons. Um, if you like to drive fast, this is the piece of equipment for you. Um, it needs at least the 7 to 12 miles per hour for the speed of operation um, in order to really get this thing rolling. You also need about 8 to 10 horsepower per foot um, for the speed to get up to speed. Some of the things that vertical tillage does not do, it does not incorporate. Because there is so little contact with the soil and so little soil movement, um, some people have tried this for either incorporating broadcast fertilizer or um, for incorporating manure, and it does not do a good job, as you can see from this photo. The other thing is that uh, vertical tillage does cause some pretty high weed pressure. Um, this here is a strip tillage where you just till along the, the, the area that's going to be seeded and then the rest of the field is not tilled. Um, so strip till obviously kind of closer to no till except for in those strips, whereas the vertical till use um, really got those weed seeds going 
uh, benefit here, though, at least, is that they were all coming in at about the same stage, and so it make uh, chemical control a bit easier. Vertical till does not run very well in a very dry soil. When our soil is really, really dry, there really isn't going to be any benefit to using it. Um, likewise, if it's really, really wet, um, it can be a bit of a mess. And so um, I know that there, it's quite often said that you, know, you can run these things through water. The question is, do you need to run it through water? Um, they can run, but this is a photo taken from Portage, so not quite the heavy, heavy gumbo soils of the Red River Valley, but still a very heavy clay. Um, and uh, this was in 2010, and, uh, or 2011, I think, sorry, um, 2011. And uh, they tried running this. The, the dealer came to do a demo at the... Uh, the Manitoba, Canada Manitoba Crop Diversification Center in Portage and insisted that it wasn't too wet to run the equipment. And uh, I'm glad that I didn't have to go back and clean this thing up at the end of the day. Um, it, there's no shot of the back of it, but the rolling baskets at the very back of this machine were just full of mud. So uh, not what I'm trying to say here is that like every other piece of equipment that you would own on your field, this equipment can have its limitations. And very wet and very dry soils are definitely limitations like any other equipment would have. So it can be helpful in sizing residue, especially where your crop type or weather conditions lead to slow decomposition. There again, as I mentioned, there's been interest in zero-till farms in the southwest because they're trying to blacken up the soil, warm up those wet soils in spring, even though while, while still leaving a lot of stubble standing. And even on eastern Manitoba, looking with corn stalks and moving towards a min-till system. Um, out of the University of Wisconsin, again, they found with working with corn, with uh, one pass vertical till, didn't bury much residue, but it did size the residue that was there. So sized it smaller, so it moved through planters better. It left about 80 to, or 70 to 80 percent of the previous corn residue in place, as well as 80 percent of last year's corn roots intact and still on the ground. And that's the benefit that they were looking at for corn here, was that you were able to leave these root balls in place. And that, in itself, is helping to maintain those root pores and that water infiltration that you can get um, and still sizing a lot of this residue. So this is from Minnesota, from Jody Dion Hughes. She's done some work looking at soybeans and corn. And I just wanted to show this to you quickly, that um, Sorry, uh, this is the Salford with two passes. Um, this is Salford two passes where they used previously a chisel plow, and here's the chisel plow and the field cultivator. Really no major difference in the amount of residue after planting between these, um, and no real difference in yield or cost when it came to the soybeans, the cost per acre. In the corn, here's where, again, not a lot of difference in the residue. Um, but uh, no real difference, again, in yield. But there was a difference in terms of the, the cost per acre in, in corn. And that's because of the disc ripping here. And again, and this is their data from Carlisle. So here they had the sulfur run at the 3-inch depth, 60% um, residue on average, and 145 bushels per acre for corn yield. Now this was a summer super coulter, which is a different vertical till equipment. And it was only run at one inch. So this is here um, a lesson in making sure that you set your equipment properly. So while um, the sulfur was set, the sulfur dealer came out to set this for her um, when she was running this with the farmer. And the summer's dealer couldn't make it out. And so the farmer said, I think I set it as deep as I can. So they checked it over and they ran it. And it turns out he only had it set at an inch. It was not as deep as it went. And there was a major impact on yield. Um, so here's the detriment of shallow tillage. Um, they didn't have that kind of yield impact on the soybeans, but they definitely saw it in the corn from not having that, uh, that piece of equipment set properly. So you always want to make sure that you've got yourself set to be a bit more aggressive um, because that one inch shallow tillage really didn't do much for them at all. So vertical till may be a helpful tool looking, for, uh, looking at managing your residue but it's just one tool to be used in combination with others. Um, it's really about tilling, tillage rotation as well as your crop rotation, um, because as you change your crops, depending on what you're growing, you may be changing how you need to till from one year to the other. You're changing the amount of residue each year that you have to deal with 
that will change what you require for tillage as well. Using the same tool at the same depth with the same residue every year is not going to benefit your soil over time. And so you need to be looking at cha and changing that up. And that's the combination, again, with your tillage rotation and your crop type. So in general, to summarize solutions for soil quality issues, if you're dealing with saline soils, don't till. If you till, you're just going to encourage um, more of that wicking to the surface. Um, you want to seed to forages where the salinity is quite high um, or to at least more saline sensitive or saline tolerant, sorry, plants. Um, remember that if there's nothing else growing there but weeds, at least they're drawing down the water table. Black soil does not draw down the water table. Um, and a, just a quick note on soil testing, because obviously with salinity, something like that, you want to make sure that you are testing your soil so that you know what type of crop to put down, because you need to know how saline it is to match up with crop sensitivity. You need to get a good representation of the field Doing a single composite uh, sample where you do a few pokes in a field and mix it all together might not be accurate enough. You might want to look at different areas of the landscape separately. Please steer clear of hot spots, so saline patches and areas behind the old homestead where the manure was spread year after year after year. Those won't give you an accurate representation of the field. And lab consistency is key. I didn't get into this too much, but uh, when you send a soil test off, especially for salinity, um, they'll run a one-to-one -one test, but some labs will run a one-to-two test, and that just basically means that they add more water compared to the soil that they're, that they're testing with. And that's fine. The way that the labs do their procedures is absolutely fine, but if you're lab hopping and changing from one lab to another, um, and uh, one year, you know, one lab does the one-to-one -one test and one does the one-to-two test, there might be a subtle difference in the, in the number that they would get as a result. So lab hopping from year to year um, doesn't help you get a good, clear idea of what's happening on your soil. And with something like salinity, you need to be looking at it every couple of years to really know if there's changes happening as water table comes up and down and salinity numbers change. Um, for soil compaction, tilling deeper will not always help. So subsoiling doesn't always pay. If you do, do want to use it, focus on your headlands only. Allow the roots to do the work for you. If you have a severe, severely compacted soil, consider seeding forages and let those forages you know, take their time to, to break through some of that compacted soil. Remember that having good soil structure is your number one defense against compaction. And finally, with residue management, you want to build your organic matter because that will increase your water holding capacity, capacity and that will help to deal with those moisture extremes. You can lose a majority of your nutrients with residue burning. Um, you want to plan to help size your residue at harvest, either with straw choppers or shortly after using carrows or something like vertical tillage, because that is going to help you to maintain and build that residue and that organic matter over time. Remember that there is no quick silver bullet when it comes to uh, soil quality. There is no fairy dust style product out there that will be able to manage or mitigate soil quality issues. When it comes to managing your soil quality, it takes time, it takes effort, and you need to consider having a well-planned crop rotation and tillage regime and fertility regime, and that will result in long-term sustainability of your operation. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I apologize again that I'm not able to be there in person, and I'd love to take any questions that you might have. Okay, Marla, just a moment, we can ask the audience if anyone has any questions for Marla. Marla, are you aware of any studies uh, about the effects of tile drainage on salinity? Tile drainage on salinity? Yes, I am. Hang on one second. I came prepared for that. How's that? Okay, um, tile drainage can decrease salinity. And uh, this is some information looking at, um, let's see if I can unhide this and show it bigger. So this is um, what AgVise Labs has put together. There are 10 different sampling points within this field. 
The tile was installed in the summer of 2002, and that's this red um, dotted line. And so you can see that across these 10 points, you were any, anywhere from um, 2 to 3.5, let's say, uh, millimoles um, using the one-to-one -one soil test um, ratio. And so over time, they were able to drop this down. And now looking at the, the solid red line of 2011, the last year of data, they have pulled down the salts quite a bit, um, down you know, 1 to 1.5 1 to 1 um, points down, the, uh, down the, the soil test level. So tile drainage can decrease salinity. How long it will take is a good question. So here, you know, halfway through, it took four years just to get to this point and then another few years to actually get down to a lower point. Um, it depends on how, how, well basically how well your tiles are running. So the tile placement depends on the drainage coefficient of the soil so that you, you actually get them running because if the tiles aren't running then nothing's actually draining through. Um, and then also, it also depends on the amount of, of precipitation that you get during that time as well because just putting the tiles in and getting water to run out the tiles isn't good enough. You need to have precipitation come and wash the salts down through the profile so that they exit the topsoil and move out through the tiles. So if you are tiling with irrigation, then that can actually um, bring down the salts faster. Um, you have to make sure, obviously, that you have good quality irrigation water. But yes, tiling can make a difference how far down you have to bring that number in order to, you know, grow something like soybeans um, is, is the first question too. And, uh, and so whether it's kind of worth it to say tile a land that takes 10 years before you can actually grow wheat canola rotation on it, I don't know if that's worth it, um, but, but it is possible. Okay. Marla, do you know the value of the nutrients in a bale of wheat straw if it's removed? If it's uh, the value of, you know what, I don't actually have the value in front of me. But I'm sure we can pull that. I think we have that somewhere online. Somewhere online. We have a producer here who says it's around 18 bucks. Okay. If you get back to me, or you can send me an email or something, and I can get that information to you, or sure. uh, point you in the direction. Okay. Anyone else? Have we ever tested a product called Electro Nine for compaction? No. Um, there are a number of products out there. I've heard of uh, Decompactor. Um, does the person who asked the question know anything of what the uh, the the active ingredient in this product is? What's the active ingredient? So really, the question is if any of these chemical products work and if they've been tested for compaction. Okay. There, um, there's actually a website that I use quite often. I think it's the, I'm trying to remember if it's the University of Iowa. Anyway, um, I have a link on it, and and what it is is it's a clearinghouse of all of the random products out there that someone has created, and uh, the data is never really that positive and beneficial. So quite often, the lack of results doesn't get published because there was no result. But the fact that there was no result is actually very important to know. And so they've put a lot of these there. And so I quite often find um, different you know, pieces of research, little re research projects that have been done looking at these different products. My rule of thumb when it comes to these products is that uh, in general, if it costs five bucks an acre or less, then any salesperson can convince you to use it. Because uh, we can afford five bucks an acre. So that typically is something that uh, 
triggers my brain when somebody tells me about this new product and oh and it only costs five dollars an acre. Um, a lot of these products, especially for uh, compaction or that type of thing, are products that have say calcium in them or something like that. And I've I've seen some calcium based products where the reality is the amount, like calcium is good for your soil. Calcium is what gives your soil structure. And in general, we have a lot of calcium in our soil to begin with. That's what helps to build the structure that we have. Um, some of these products, they add so little extra calcium that there's no way that they would actually be beneficial. So if anyone has any specific product that they've come across, um, give that information to Gaetan if you don't mind taking that and send it off to me. Um, and I can get back to you on it if you like, but in general, there really is no special product for compaction or for salinity or anything like that that you can spray on a field um, to really to make any kind of a difference. 